In this problem, we're asked to determine qualitatively whether aqueous solutions of the following salts are acidic, basic, or neutral. And so what we're going to do for each salt is look at the cation and look at the anion and either think about the cation or anion itself directly as an acid or a base, or the conjugate base or acid, if we're familiar with it, to get a sense of what the original acid or base is in terms of strength. So for example, KBr, well the very first thing we should do here is split this into its component ions, K plus and Br minus. And K plus, well that is the conjugate acid of KOH. So let's actually write out the conjugate base here. KOH is the conjugate base and think about that. Well that's a strong acid, a strong base, right? Meaning the conjugate acid is a negatively weak acid. K plus is an absolutely unreactive rock of an ion. So K plus won't react with water at all. Br minus is the conjugate base of HBr. That's a strong acid, right? So Br minus, likewise being the conjugate base of a strong acid, will not react with water to any appreciable degree. This makes KBr a neutral salt overall. When dissolved in water, it will give solutions with a neutral pH, pH 7. What about NaHCO3? Okay, well here again, let's split it up into its component ions, Na plus, and HCO3 minus. Now Na plus is the conjugate acid of a strong base, NaOH. And so just like K plus really, this is an ion that's not going to react with water to any appreciable degree. HCO3 minus, well that's the conjugate base of something we know to be a weak acid, H2CO3. Let's remind ourselves here, this is a weak acid. It's an acid and it's not on the list of strong acids, therefore it must be weak. You could also look up a Ka value if needed to verify this. This means that HCO3- minus is a weak base. And let's write that under HCO3-. minus. This is a weak base. And so the salt overall has a completely unreactive cation. Let's write that, unreactive but a weakly basic anion that makes the salt overall basic. Solutions of NaHCO3 in water will give basic pH values. Na2HPO4, let's do the ion dance again, if you will. We have Na+, and in fact, we already know that this is an unreactive cation, so I'm actually going to just copy this down, because why not, right? It's the exact same cation, we can apply the exact same reasoning, so if something's going to happen here in C, it's going to involve this anion HPO4-2-. Something we glossed over in B is that HCO3- actually has the capacity to act as an acid as well. It could give up a proton and make carbonate, CO3-2-. Here we have HPO4. 2 minus, which has the capacity to lose a proton as well to make PO4 3 minus, the phosphate anion. This could also add a proton acting as a base to make H2 PO4 minus. So let's write out actually both of those possibilities. And so if this loses a proton, we would end up with PO4 3 minus. If this gains a proton, we would end up with H2 PO4 minus. And what actually dominates, the behavior that actually dominates here depends on the relative K values associated with these two processes, gaining a proton to make H2 PO4 minus and losing a proton to make PO4 3 minus. And in this particular case, it would be necessary to go look up the pKa values, in fact, for the salts that are uh, involved here. And I'll spare you the math of doing that. It's available in the OpenStax textbook, free of charge. When you do that, you find that, in fact, the Kb for picking up an additional proton and going back to H2PO4- minus with the negative one charge is much greater than the Ka for losing an additional proton and going to phosphate. So the, uh, the dominant behavior here is the picking up of an additional proton to form the conjugate acid H2PO4- minus which is a weak acid, 
And so the anion itself here is behaving as a weak base. And again, I'll spare you the math because the conceptual understanding is more important here, but it's worth going out and calculating on your own that in fact, Kb for HPO4 2 minus is much, much greater than Ka. This makes the salt overall basic. Just like in the previous case, we've got an anion that will tend to pick up protons from water, produce hydroxide, produce a solution with a pH greater than seven. Finally, we have NH4F here. NH4F is the NH4 plus cation and the fluoride anion. And here again, we have a really interesting case where NH4, when it loses a proton, produces NH3, which we know to be a weak base. And F minus, when it gains a proton, picks up a proton to form HF, which is also a weak acid. So now we're comparing the Ka for ammonium to the Kb for fluoride. Which of those two K values is larger will tell us which ion is the active or reactive or dominant ion, the one that will react with water predominantly to give the overall pH as acidic or basic. And here again, as it turns out, Ka for NH3 is greater than Kb for HF. So let's write that out. Ka for NH3 is greater than Kb for F minus, Kb for F minus. And as such, the dominant ion will be the ammonium cation here. This will be the ion that reacts with water predominantly to produce the observed solution pH, meaning that the solution overall is going to be acidic with NH4 plus giving up protons to water to produce an excess of hydronium ion and a pH less than seven. So just to summarize, in each case, we first split up the ionic compound in it, into its component ions. We considered the conjugates to get a sense of the acidity or basicity of the original ion. This can be helpful if you're more familiar with the conjugates than the ions themselves. And we also, in cases where it was necessary, compared Ka and Kb values, sometimes for the very same ion. These amphoteric ions that have both hydrogens and negative charge have the capacity to act as acids or bases. And there we need to be careful about considering Ka versus Kb for those ions. We also did a Ka versus Kb comparison for the cation and anion within a salt, looking those up and using the greater of the two to rationalize the observed or predict the observed pH. A little bit earlier, we noted that hydrated metal cations can serve as acids, and this slide gives us a nice picture of how this works. Take, for example, the aluminum 3 plus cation. When that's dissolved in water, it's surrounded by water molecules, and a kind of archetypal picture of this is six water molecules in an octahedral arrangement around the aluminum center. That's what you're seeing right here. Now, these bonds, as we'll learn later when we talk about coordination chemistry, are really derived from water donating a pair of electrons to the metal center. The metal center does not contribute electrons to these bonds in any way. Let me draw this out here and make it a little bit clearer. What this does is it sort of siphons electron density away from the hydrogens attached to the oxygen in water. This makes these hydrogens relatively acidic. So for example, a separate water molecule could come along with a pair of electrons and pluck off a proton from this complex. When that happens, we've got the hydrated metal complex acting as an acid, giving up a proton, and we've got water acting as a base. And the resulting product you can see here is hydronium ion, as well as the conjugate base of the metal complex with a new hydroxide anion in there, derived from the water that lost a proton, and the remaining five waters still there. And notice, but the charge has changed. We've gone from three plus overall to two plus overall as the complex has accepted an electron, an additional electron, and the positive charge has sort of shifted over to the water molecule in hydronium. And notice here, the Ka is actually pretty substantial. If you do a pKa calculation on this, you'll see that this is comparable to acetic acid 
in pKa. So these hydrated metal cations can be quite acidic in, uh, in water. Three other examples on this slide that are worth thinking about. And we can think about e the reaction of each of these with water to understand why and, and how they act as, as acids. And the key conceptual idea here is, again, that notion that coordination of a water molecule to a metal center is going to acidify the hydrogens in the water molecule and, and allow a separate water molecule to act as a base. So here, for example, with iron-3, we've actually already seen this one in an earlier video, the product we get is this iron hydroxide with five waters left with a charge of plus two and a hydronium ion in aqueous solution. In fact, we're going to get hydronium ions for all of these, and I'll go ahead and fill in the rest of the products in the remainder of this video and just make the point that you should be aware that hydrated metal cations can act as acids when dissolved in water. This is particularly prevalent for cations with charges that are large and positive, plus two, plus three, plus four. These charges are so high that any coordinated water molecules often become quite acidic. 